from the beginning of it to, you know, the business that it is, the families that it supports, the people that are employed by the fishermen. Then from there, it's like to the wholesalers. From there, it's to the grocery stores, the restaurants, the hotels and everything. So, I mean, it, it touches everything. Thanks for joining us on Louisiana's Playground Podcast, your roadmap to all things Lake Charles, Louisiana. I'm Brady Raynard. And I'm Anna Strider. We are excited to bring you another episode of Louisiana's Playground Podcast, and it is full of so much of what we love, which is our Louisiana seafood. And boy, is this a fun episode, talking with Samantha Carroll of the Louisiana Seafood Board. She goes into basically what the board is and all of the things they oversee and how they help bring fresh, delicious Louisiana seafood to your table. But before we talk about the Louisiana seafood industry and how it impacts all aspects of our things to do, our culinary cuisine, and even festivals and events in our area, we are going to talk about our favorite topic, which is food during our On the Eats segment. On the Eats is the segment where Anna and I head to local restaurants in town to give you the lowdown on what they're offering maybe even how they got started, the type of environment, and ultimately the rundown of another local great place to eat. And this week we are bringing you to Nina P's Restaurant, which is located on West McNeese Street that's just off of Nelson Road. And it connects you between the I-210 Loop, which is right near the casino area, and then also McNeese University. So it's right there, centrally located, and boy, is it a community staple. And it's also a family staple for more than 23 years. Uh, Nina P., the matriarch of the family, along with now her daughter Fallon, have run the restaurant, Fallon's now the GM of it, since August of 2000. They offer Louisiana Cajun Creole seafood done by family recipes that actually have a very strong French tie. Nina P. herself moved here when she was just one years old to the United States from France. So that really ties into the restaurant having such a strong New Orleans French style culture to it, not only from the design of the building, it's got that brick out of face with that iron rod steel patio type. And it really just gives you the ambiance of a New Orleans style restaurant. And then the menu has nods to Mardi Gras with their Lundi Gras starters and their big parades dinners and really just all of the energy that the New Orleans French Quarter and all of the cuisine in that part of the state really represents. But here in southwest Louisiana, where there's just a little bit more spice, per se. For sure. And it's a quaint little building and and they have Mardi Gras decorations and they've really gone all in on it. And it is A heck of a lot of fun. They also have one of the best gumbos in town. And don't take it from me, Lanyet Magazine, who does their annual superlatives, the Of the Year series, and their gumbo, Chicken and Sausage, has been named the best in Southwest Louisiana for over a decade. But that's just the start of their delicious menu. They have such a wide variety of menu options. Everything from their spuds menu, where there's multiple different types of spuds there. They have an intricate salad menu as well. And I say that because it's such a great spot for lunch and dinner. And they have a really strong lunch crowd. And these types of dishes really speak to that. They also have boudin-inspired dishes, grilled and fried chicken, and fried and grilled fish and burgers and just so many different options on the menu. You really can't go wrong with anything you order. And also this time of the year, if you celebrate Lent, they have a special Lent menu and different offerings that are unique during this time, which is obviously great to take advantage of as well. But the whole menu is really tied together by their signature crawfish cream sauce. It's like a combo between an etouffee sauce and a pasta sauce that's somewhere in the middle, and it is incredibly delicious. The crawfish flavor is so good with a very buttery flavor, and they put it on everything. We got a number of different items while we were there. We did get the crawfish bread, which had mozzarella cheese and a number of other cheeses mixed on top. Crawfish are right in season right now, and that crawfish cream sauce, all perfectly toasted. I mean, I couldn't get enough of this bread. And I'm typically not a big bread person. You and Catherine cleaned the the plate. I think I got one piece in between you guys. Yeah, you didn't didn't go for it hard enough. (laughs) But that complimented my 
entree that I got just as much, their Mardi Gras stack. It is one of the famous entrees. So many people love it there. It's got a beautiful presence to it. And they even put a little mask on top. So it's a stack of two crab cakes over easy eggs, that crawfish cream sauce on top, and all topped with four perfectly golden fried shrimp. I took it home for leftovers as well. It was a large plate. And because they're Louisiana shrimp too, they would be con- considered in the jumbo range. Four large shrimp on top, as you said, fried to a golden perfection. Absolutely delicious. Meanwhile, I saw the black and red fish, and I am a sucker for black and fish. It really is a great Louisiana staple here in town uh, and is always a great order on any menu. And they do it perfectly. The crisp, burnt edges which is exactly what you're looking for. And the fish still had so much moisture and the seasoning all over it. Absolutely incredible. And the cream sauce really tones down the blackened, but in the absolute perfect way with some nice seared vegetables on the side. And it was not too heavy, but still you were you left full because of how good it all was. I did get to taste a little bite of Brady's redfish and the veggies that he got on the side as well, and they were delicious. I mean, definitely, I'll have to go back just to get that for myself. But let's not forget about the boudin egg rolls that they had. These egg rolls, I mean, I love boudin personally, and these had the perfect tie of all the different mixtures. It was sweet and savory. The egg rolls themselves are hand rolled each and every time. They're stuffed with pepper jack cheese, jalapenos, of course your boudin, and then on top is a steam syrup drizzled across as well as powdered sugar and I'm telling you it was the perfect combination of flavors like I just I'm sold it is there's something about that fried saltiness with the hint of sweetness at that syrup because it's not a super sweet syrup no so that hint of sweet that the syrup gives the salty sweet combo look salty and sweet is a is a flavor staple for a reason and the boudin egg rolls hits that perfectly even as someone that doesn't care for boudin I ate my portion gladly everything truly hit the spot it was absolutely delicious and the staff in the restaurant are just so incredibly welcoming many of them have been there working there for years and just truly make it somewhere that you feel like you're home and you're stepping in to your family's kitchen for a bite to eat so head on over for either lunch or dinner to nina peas give it a try and tell us what you think From a great meal to a great guest, we welcome on Samantha Carroll, the Executive Director of the Louisiana Seafood Promotion and Marketing Board. In addition to that role, Samantha is a renowned chef that has used her Louisiana roots to carve out a role in the state's culinary scene. She's owned and operated restaurants with her husband, Cody Carroll, as well as being named the Queen of Louisiana Seafood back in 2013. That led to a multi-season show on the Food Network. Now she uses those skills to promote Louisiana seafood to the world, Welcome to the show, Sam. Thanks. (laughs) Thanks for having me. We're excited to have you here on today's show, Samantha, to talk about the Louisiana seafood industry and all that it entails in our culinary cuisine here in Southwest Louisiana. But before we get started with our conversation today, we'd like to ask you a few questions to get to know you a little bit better. Are you ready? Yes. Is it rapid fire? Sort of. Mostly, yes. I'm ready. (laughs) (laughs) Crawfish or gumbo? Y'all, this is dirty. It's very difficult work. It's a hard choice. I can't. Can I just plead the fifth? (laughs) Is that an answer? I mean, I love them both so much. It's like picking your favorite kid. Um, Okay. I have never thought about it. I'll go with crawfish. It's almost crawfish season. I'll go with crawfish. Interesting. But isn't gumbo the reason that you got into the culinary scene altogether? Yeah. And I also beat Bobby Flay with gumbo. So um, gumbo holds a special place in my heart. But you chose crawfish. Because I'm craving crawfish right now. <laughs> <laughs> what, what, right what, is it, what is it do you love? Is it is it the um, bowls? Is it fried seafood? Is it when you kind of do more of uh, like etouffees? What, what is it about crawfish? Um, everything. I mean, it's kind of like a drug. Like eating crawfish is like, you know, people are calling restaurants left and right. Like, you got them yet? You got them? How much are they? How much? You got them? No. Okay. Next week, I'm going to call back next week. Okay. So it's it's seriously like a culinary drug <laughs> in Louisiana. And as soon as you get them, people, I mean, I just love to sit down and eat them. I mean, a cold beer and like a frozen mug with crawfish and you're eating your potatoes and your corn. I mean, it's just everything. So I'm going crawfish. That's such a native Louisiana thing. I know when I have my friends down here for the first time, we, I mean, 
we couldn't have ordered that much crawfish. And there was like eight of us, but we had like none of them had ever had it before. It was maybe my second time. So it was just like all of us slowly picking at them and we barely ate any. And that was like the biggest deal. Everyone still talks about it. Yeah. Well, now that we've gotten through that <laughs> tough decision there, hopefully these other ones are a little bit easier. Okay. Poolside or beachside? Beachside. Why? Because I love Grand Isle. <laughs> I love it. I love going to the little fisherman's town and I love the little beach. My daughter does not want to fish. She doesn't want to do anything hunting. So it's like, mom, can we go to the beach? That's our so beach So it's like now. family time as well. Yeah. Okay. Last one. Concert or comedy show? Concert. Hands down. Do you have a favorite genre? Everything. <laughs> <laughs> um, my husband and I have declared this is the year of the concerts for us because we've booked and gotten tickets for several concerts so far that are happening. Which one are you most stoked about? Tyler Childers. Um, oh, I want to see him. Well, Lainey Wilson's playing here. We're contemplating coming back for that. <laughs> well, I think you, you should. should. I know. <laughs> um, there's just so many concerts. Now that we've gotten to know you a little bit better through how you enjoy your time both in Louisiana and here in Southwest Louisiana, let's get to the task at hand, which is Louisiana seafood. Obviously, such a big part of our culture and economy, which is is why we have a seafood promotion and marketing board. What is the board? It is an actual board. And we have respective members that represent each facet of the seafood industry. So, you know, we have a crawfish representative. We have a finfish representative, a shrimp representative, an oyster representative, an alligator representative. Um, then we have a marketing person. You know, they all have their own boards, too, within their own industries. And then it's kind of a communal place for all of us to get together at our meetings and discuss what's happening in the seafood industry and kind of for everybody to hear everybody out. Um, when you think the marketing and promotion side of it, you're automatically probably going to like the awareness of like what's happening in the industry or what battles we're facing or, you know, recovery issues, anything like that. But then also it's food. At the end of the day, it's getting eaten. So we get to have the fun part of it too, of, you know, beautiful dishes and interacting with different restaurants and other members of the hospitality industry. And it's really fun at the end of the day because yeah, you're battling your different things and there's things that are happening within the state that everyone's, you know, really discussing and, and trying to evoke change in certain situations. But then, you know, People talk about how they love seafood gumbo and people, you know, everything revolves around at the end of the day, it's it's food. So we get to market and promote that. I always say whenever I describe our office to people, I say we're kind of like cousins with the Louisiana Office of Tourism at the state level because when people come to Louisiana, they're eating. <laughs> Yes. So we're kind of like the direct link to them. And a lot of times within our office, too, we partner on things with the Office of Tourism. So if there's a promotion or anything they're trying to do to get out awareness on something or to, you know, whether it be with state parks or, you know, a tourism attraction, there's always a seafood element involved because we got to feed people, too. <laughs> so how important do you feel like the, the board is for the the operation, the operation for the seafood industry, and ultimately, why was it really created in the first place? They're the pulse. I mean, they're the lifeline within the fishing community that keeps everyone abreast to what's happening. Um, you know, and a lot of times the issues or the battles that you know an oyster fisherman is up against, you know, a shrimp fisherman might be, you know, hate to use this pun, in the same boat. <laughs> essentially. <laughs> um, but, you know, and there's there's a lot of things that happen where it takes a lot more than just one voice of an industry, of a one specific fishing industry to to go up against something or battle something or bring attention to something. So the fact that everyone as a whole still kind of works together in the same room, it's, it's something that that speaks volumes for, you know, just us as a state and an industry. It's been around for nearly 40 years, so it's clearly a staple of the state and what we're promoting, like you said. How did you get involved? I was actually at an event, and um, the lieutenant governor you know, mentioned to me, he's like, hey, you know about the seafood board, right? And I'm like, yes, 
I do. <laughs> I'm very <laughs> familiar. And he was like, well, what do you think about working and doing that? And I was like, well, I mean, I'm passionate about it. Um, I accepted the offer and I became executive director a little bit less than a year later after I accepted the position. And it just kind of ignited a passion in me that is much further than, you know, the restaurant industry. It really opens your eyes to things with lawmaking and the way that that things are regulated in our in our state and in our nation. And the fascination also stems I've always had an appreciation for farmers and fishermen, but like getting to know these people personally and their lives and their day to day, it really ignites a passion in you and you and you feel really proud to be a part of it. You get to hear their stories yeah. and really understand why they do what they do. Yeah, and it's you have an expert like in your Rolodex. So if somebody asks me a question, you know, about oyster farming and it's something that I just I've never heard of before, you know, I can just call up, you know, my oyster fishermen and you know, they have they've been in these industries for years and their family before them and you know, their great grandfather before them. So it's it's great to have to have those people. <laughs> Is there any way to quantify the impact that seafood has on the state of Louisiana? From the beginning of it to, you know, the business that it is, the families that it supports, the people that are employed by the fishermen. And you then you have to think about it it touches so much the industry. Then from there it's like to the wholesalers, from there it's to, you know, the grocery stores, the restaurants, the hotels and everything the people at home. So, I mean, it, it touches everything. I mean, if there's food involved, it's it's involved too. I, I saw a stat that I was really kind of impressed with uh, on your guys' website. One out of 70 jobs here in the state is directly related to the seafood industry. Yep. I mean, yes. that, that just shows you the, the kind of the level of the buy-in. Mm-hmm. That hasn't wavered. You know, it has its up and down, its ups and downs with whatever's happening in our environment and our day to day, but that hasn't wavered. It's a billion dollar industry. Two point four billion dollars, I think, was the latest figure that you guys had. Mm -hmm. Obviously pre COVID, but you know, that's still a number that shows w the economic impact that we see. Yeah. It's huge. And that number is just continuing to grow and increase as we're rebounding, especially here in southwest Louisiana and along the Gulf, which we have, I think I was reading over seventy two hundred miles. Mm -hmm of Gulf Coast in the state. So as that's the communities are coming back and everything, we're just seeing that industry grow. With the fishermen and everything, but also the communities that are directly tied to the industry. You know, there's certain places in Louisiana that you look at and you're like, you know, it's, the, you know, it's coast and all that kind of stuff. But, you know, who lives down here? And it's, it's the people that, that make it happen for us. They're the ones that live there. And I think it's so impressive considering the size of the state and how little of our state actually borders the, the the Gulf, that we're the second largest supplier of seafood in the country. Exactly. Yeah. So Alaska, we know, is first. They have a lot more waterway. Have, yeah, coastline. To work with. <laughs> Um, but we like to say, like, in the United States. Yeah, the, lo <laughs> the lower 48. Yeah, yes. we're right? number one. You talked a little bit about how you've learned so much in the different intricacies of the industry, including lawmaking. And I know that's a big part of what you're promoting as far as on the federal side or on the state side and just making sure that those individuals are represented. And there's been some laws lately about how if it's Louisiana seafood, it has to be labeled on the packaging. Right. That's something that's really cool and kind of the pun there because the acronym is cool. Yeah. It's like domestic or imported. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's um that was a big win. And so when you go to a restaurant, it has to be labeled on your menu for your shrimp and your crawfish, whether it is domestic or it is imported. And so the health department for the state of Louisiana actually enforces that. But um, it was a big move because a lot of restaurants were embarrassed because then they had to let their secrets out that, OK, the shrimp po' boy that you love and you tell everybody about because it's so Louisiana, the shrimp are from Indonesia. No, 
that's embarrassing for a restaurant owner. So in that case, you're going to, you know, pay a great price for a great Louisiana premium product that was harvested here in our waters. And then you're going to be proud to put product of Louisiana or domestically, you know, domestic shrimp. So it kind of was a big eye opener to a lot of people. And you can search like you can go on the, you know, health department website for the state and it'll show you the restaurants that are in violation of it because a they didn't mention on their menu where it's coming from. And because of that, you can automatically deduce that. okay, it's not it's not from Louisiana. You mentioned it was a win. Why was that a focus? The respective task forces for the, you know, the shrimp and the crawfish, they were the ones that, you know, fought for this, mainly because the shrimp, yeah, we supply a lot of shrimp in Louisiana, but we also import a lot of shrimp. And this was a kind of, this was a way of battling that. So it really, it kind of brought to light and really made the consumers aware of, you know, what their rights were to know as where their products are coming from. You had mentioned the health department was involved in that process too. Did anything with the way that the FDA test had to do with that? Some of these imported seafood products, shrimp mainly, um, they're coming in and they're containing things like antibiotics and all these different things that, you know, the United States does not allow in their food. And a lot of these things have been tied to sicknesses, to stomach cancers, like things that eventually harm the consumer And we're just like wide open, letting it happen. Like, come on in, everybody. So, you know, our lieutenant governor, he is very passionate about the imports and and battling those. And so he was at a conference for all of the lieutenant governors, you know, of the nation. And he got with them and he, he passed this resolution to try to charge a little 10 cent tax on all of the stuff that's being imported from these other countries. And, you know, that would go towards hiring more inspectors and testing more seafood. And ultimately, because all the things that are found in these seafoods are not allowed in the United States, sending more seafood back. So kind of leveling the playing field for us here in Louisiana by sending everything, you know, giving them less to work with and and flood our shelves with. We've talked a lot about the different types of seafood that you represent, and that is shrimp, oysters, crabs, crawfish, alligators, and finfish. Mm -hmm. What exactly is finfish? So it is all like catfish. I could list them all for you, but it's all, you know, the wild caught fish that um, like drum, tuna. Okay. So think of, you know, the fish that graces your plate at a restaurant, and it's pretty much that, unless it's like from freshwater. We technically don't represent freshwater fish per se. Just estuaries and saltwater? Mm Mm-hmm. Saltwater fin fish, yep. And so obviously because of that, there is a real focus, it seems like, on what I kind of call the big five of seafood, right, here in the state, shrimp, oysters, crabs, crawfish, and then alligator Shrimp specifically, of that $2.4 billion annually that the state brings in, I've seen shrimp be worth around one point three annually. That is way more than half the market. Yeah, they're the stakeholders, I think. <laughs> um, yeah, it's huge. And the shrimping industry especially, and we kind of touched on this a little while ago, but you know, it could be a major operation with a fleet of boats, or it can be just one fisherman and his one boat that only goes out, you know, 70 miles at the max and then comes back. So there's a lot of different people in the shrimp industry and in different scales. Are there different rules and regulations that you all have to really focus on with each one? Well, I mean, they all have their own respective seasons. Um, and then they all are so different with harvesting. Essentially, you know, crawfish is farmed, but we do have, you know, wild caught crawfish in like our basins and our spillways and things like that. Oysters is so fascinating because you put out your culch is what they call it. Like, you know, your gravel and your rock and everything into your oyster beds. 
and you won't harvest an oyster from that for three years. Three years. Three years. So oysters, you know, that's that's a that's time, you know, and that's, you know, establishing yourself and then keeping it up and keeping it going. I mean, just the other day we were talking to a fish house here in Louisiana and he was telling me about an oyster fisherman and he spent a million dollars in in gravel and rock to put out so that oysters can grow on them and he won't see them for three years. So that's crazy. Alligator. I mean, that has been crazy because of how Hollywood is it has become now with the success of Swamp People and the TV show and everybody knows about alligator hunting but that is I mean you get your tags you harvest um yeah the point about the oysters what's what's so fascinating you know the, the man that you were talking about is someone that's just having to get in so that's a, a huge price to pay for a profit that you're not going to see for a number of at least three years. And even then you're probably not going to make that much money in just that three year period. That's probably a 10 year investment. And that's why I think the family owned companies are really the glue because they're the ones that have spent decades worth of time, effort, uh, and financial contributions to create that business. That's a hot topic right now too, is, you know, farmers, they have crop insurance. So if they plant their sugar cane, if they plant you know, their corn, whatever it may be, and a hurricane blows through, well, you know, their crop is insured for, you know, the seed and everything that they put into it. Now, a fisherman is pretty much a farmer of water, <laughs> like especially in, you know, oyster situation. Mm-hmm. They're putting out their seed and, you know, it's taken years for t- to harvest something. And and that's that's a big battle right now, especially with all like the hurricanes and everything that has happened. A lot of these fishermen are starting to, you know, knock on D.C.'s door and be like, hey, I think we need crop insurance. We need we need some kind of crop quote. I'm doing air quotes because it's a podcast. So I'm just telling you <laughs> insert air quotes here. Um, they need some sort of, of crop insurance. That makes a lot of sense. Because think about the gentleman with, OK, one million dollars out there and then a hurricane blows through. And everything's washed away. You That's not insurable. Is that something that you guys have kind of focused on in, in terms of helping or partnering with? I mean, it's a discussion pretty much at every one of our board meetings. And everyone is very passionate about it. And I think it's just going to take the right person to be like, duh. <laughs> you know, why haven't we done this for our fishermen yet? This makes no sense. We need to be able to insure this. And not only that, but that'll give us... Uh, you know, just stability within the workforce, you know, people will be less intimidated in taking that risk, knowing that there could be storms on the horizon or other pandemics coming in the future, but they would be more at ease, I guess you could say, to take the risk if they knew that their investment could at least be returned to them in some manner. And speaking of the business side, when when kind of looking up some numbers and facts uh, just about the industry as a whole, I was really surprised to see that you had mentioned, you know, crawfish uh, or rather gators had become Hollywood. And obviously crawfish had always been a staple of our culture. Alligators and crawfish make up less than 10 percent combined of economic impact per year Mm -hmm. for what we do. And, And that's what kind of blows me away where they're the most famous, but yet not the most impactful. Yeah. And you got to think of it kind of like a delicacy standpoint too. The seasons are a lot shorter. And I think that's what really makes it something that is so desirable for someone. Um, Yeah. You can get alligator, you know, tail meat and all that kind of stuff, but the window where you can actually hunt alligators and all that stuff is happening is short. And same thing with crawfish season and crawfish season is, you know, just like any other seafood industry, but it is weather dependent. So if we get a freeze and the ponds freeze over, well, you ain't fishing that. No crawfish, crawfish can't move in cold water. They're cold blooded. So, you know, all these things factor into that. We've talked a lot about the industry and the impact that it has on our economy, but there's also some really fun parts of it that the Louisiana Seafood Board and the the state has really come together to make it a draw to be able to show off the, what the chefs are doing as well as the seafood products. And we have the Great American Seafood Cook-Off as well as the Louisiana Seafood Cook-Off. Mm-hmm. 
And that's where you got your title that really launched you into this position. Yeah. So this year is really exciting for Southwest Louisiana because the Louisiana Seafood Cook-Off is moving to the Golden Nugget here in Lake Charles. We're on the road, you guys. <laughs> How have you seen that event grow? You know, obviously winning it a, now a decade ago this year. How have you seen that event grow? God. Sorry, sorry, sorry. You had to throw that yeah, out there. Yeah, I know. Decade ago. <laughs> yeah. I cringed for her in that statement. <laughs> yeah. Excuse me while I go cry. <laughs> We've got um, some tissues right here. <laughs> wait, what was the question? I stop at a decade. <laughs> With the event moving, um, <laughs> it's recently awesome. been in Lafayette, obviously. Yes. Moving here to Lake Charles. Since that time that you've really been involved in in having won it with your husband back in 2013, seeing it now. Uh, <laughs> Don't leave it out a decade ago. A what? decade. That's 10 years. One, two. We're going to count all count the way through. Down. Yeah. Um, no, seeing crazy. it grow from a, a participant back in 2013 to now being in charge of it at the head. How have you seen that event grow and further represent this state? Oh, wow. Leaps and bounds. I will tell you, whenever my husband and I competed the first time in 2012. We lost, like never even placed. I'm pretty sure we came in last. We had this dish conceptualized, like we were infusing crawfish fat into pasta. We were doing all these things, bells and whistles. Well, we didn't place. And we're like, man, what is wrong with us? And so the second year we went back and then we took first place. So we went from like dead last <laughs> to first. But just from then, from seeing all the past people that have come on to take the crown, it's not only that the the cook-off itself gets better, but the opportunities that the winners get get better. And like the exposure that these chefs get get better. And and rightfully so, because I cannot tell you of a time that we have crowned a champion and that person's been like a loser. Like they're all like stand up people in the in their home communities, in their restaurants. They're passionate about Louisiana seafood. And um, it's just really exciting. If you haven't been to a cook off, you need to come because it really looks like something you would see on Chopped. It's just like live and in your face. You're getting to witness it live. And I think you're firsthand showing what those opportunities can be for a chef. Everything that kind of came after you and your husband opened another restaurant, had your own food network show kind of following in, uh, you know, I was, I was talking to Anna about it there in, in that mid to late 2010s, Louisiana really became quote unquote Hollywood with swamp people and duck dynasty. You guys getting a show. There were a whole bunch of shows. There was all of a sudden a lot of national interest in Louisiana culture. What was that like being uh, having that little bit of a cooking reality show style it was crazy i don't know you grow up watching people on tv like for me emerald lagasse was like he was it um and you grow up watching these people on tv and as like a little chef sam growing up you know playing with my easy bake oven i'm like one day i want to do that you know and then you get the opportunity to do it and it's just crazy Number one, the amount of business it brings to the state, not just for viewership, but the amount of people that they have to fly here to work the set. Like, I mean, they probably had about 30 people that they flew here just for our show, staying in like our hotel rooms and buying breakfast, lunch and dinner from our local restaurants every day. So that was very eye opening to me, but it, it, it was an honor. It was really fun. And the show Cajun Aces, correct? Yes. Just wanted to make sure I realized I didn't say the, the show. You guys had two seasons. Mm -hmm. So that's yeah. that was a nice little run. It was. And it's super cool that you mentioned the film industry because that is also an industry here in Louisiana yeah. that's really vibrant and impacts our local economy. But you were talking about a lot of the different experiences that these chefs get to have. And what's really awesome for us here in Southwest Louisiana is that the 2022 reigning Louisiana seafood queen, Amanda Cousy, is here in Lake Charles. Yeah. And she was formerly at a restaurant in downtown and is 
now working with another group to open her own kitchen in the area. So just really exciting things. And she gets to represent not only our destination, but the state on a national level, which is just really special. And all of those chefs that we win at the Louisiana Seafood Cook-Off then go to compete at the Great American Seafood Cook-Off, and that happens in New Orleans. And yes. that's chefs from across the country. Yes. That one's crazy because it is very much like Miss America, but culinary style. I mean, you have all these different people, and not only are they bringing in, like, the best of the best chefs of that state, they're bringing in, you know, the best of the best seafood that their state harvests. So there's su there's such a wide range of seafood. It's legit. And, you know, there are a lot of cooking competitions all throughout Louisiana just associated with our festivals and things like that. But this this one is just I just I don't I guess I'm going to say professional. Like, I just feel like it's so professional. And, and at this point, I mean, this will be the 16th annual. So it's no shock that it has been become so successful and it's really helped continuously given Louisiana chefs a new platform to be able to represent the state and represent their career as well. And in addition, when it moves here uh, in June, and June 27th, that's the day, uh, we also will have Chuck Taste, which will be a ticketed event. Tickets are $50. You can, you'll can you be able to purchase them online as well that you can get a taste of, I think they said 20 or so restaurants, local restaurants, will give you a taste of their uh, culinary um, treats. And so what a good time. Yeah, you like that culinary treats. Will be a, I like it. Yeah. A tasty evening. Yeah. A Is that tasty, what you said earlier? I love that. Chuck Taste, <laughs> a nice tasty evening coming up in June in conjunction with the event. Well, it was great to have you on the show today, Samantha, as we talked about the seafood industry and all that it impacts the state of Louisiana. With the Louisiana Seafood Cook-Off coming on June 27th, I know that you all are putting on a really – great sweepstakes for one two lucky winners <laughs> the winner and a guest yes yes so we are going to have a sweepstakes a competition if you follow us on facebook at the louisiana seafood promotion and marketing board facebook page you'll see a link where you can click and it'll bring you to sign up and register for our sweepstakes the winner will get to see a vip experience and experience VIP style, <laughs> the Louisiana <laughs> Seafood Cook-Off here in Lake Charles. Um, they will have a stay at the Golden Nugget. Um, Chef Amanda, the current reigning seafood queen, will prepare a private lunch for these winners here in Lake Charles. And um, there's going to be a brewery tour, a private brewery tour of Crying Eagle Brewery. So all kind of things. Am I eligible? Yes. Oh. Yes, you are. I was expecting to hear no. I'm eligible, so... <laughs> <laughs> I didn't we're rule all, myself out. We're <laughs> all kidding. eligible. I know. Everybody's I already, eligible. I already sent it to my family. Yes. As <laughs> soon as it was announced. Yes. So follow them on Facebook and to enter in the sweepstakes and enter your chance to come and visit us here in Lake Charles. Thanks again to Sam for joining us here on the show. And thank you for taking time out of your day to join us on the podcast. If you enjoyed the show, please leave us a rating or a review wherever you listen to podcasts. Each rating and review helps us grow our audience to be able to further bring you the stories of Lake Charles and Southwest Louisiana. Go to visitlakecharles.org slash podcast for more episodes, events going on this weekend, and of course, where to eat. I'm Anna Strider. And I'm Brittany Raynard. Thanks for coming play at Louisiana's Playground. Set to you.